A normal takeoff occurs when the aircraft is departing into a direct headwind from a paved surface with plenty of runway distance available and with no obstacles close to the end of the runway. Taking off directly into the wind allows the aircraft to take off using the least amount of runway. This is essentially because the wind is giving extra airflow over the wings, so the aircraft doesn't need to travel as fast to get to the same airspeed recommended for takeoff. At this point in your training, we are going to go over a simplified procedure for takeoff to get the general idea. However, you probably will find it helpful to practice the full procedure, which mostly just consists of additional callouts. We will be going over the full procedure in a future lesson. The takeoff procedure begins with safely entering the runway. Before ever crossing the hold short marking for the runway, the pilot needs to always visually scan the entire runway length, as well as the arrival and the departure paths, to ensure no hazards like other aircraft or vehicles exist. Secondly, the pilot should also confirm they are entering the correct runway. Verbally brief what runway you are entering, and confirm with your instructor which direction you will be taking off in. If you're at a towered airport, make sure your runway is in agreement with the clearance given by ATC. As you taxi out onto the runway, position the plane on the runway center line. Then, confirm that the heels of your feet are on the floor and off the brakes, so you don't accidentally step on them. Just like when taxiing on a taxiway, you want the runway center line to line up with your right leg. Once you are lined up on the correct runway, smoothly apply full power. The adding of power should take about two seconds. If you add the power too quickly, the engine could backfire, adding power too slowly, and you risk wasting available runway. As the Cessna starts to accelerate down the runway, you may notice a tendency for the plane to turn to the left. You will need to add a slight amount of rudder to counteract this and keep the airplane on the center line. Continue to make small rudder pedal inputs to maintain the aircraft on center line. Make the inputs as soon as you start seeing the airplane drift from the runway center line. Waiting too long to correct could result in a runway excursion. Once full power is applied, quickly glance inside to check the engine instruments, making sure all of the indications are in their normal parameters. As the airplane continues to accelerate, make sure that both of your airspeed indicators are indicating speed above zero and increasing. Keep in mind, however, that the G1000 will not indicate an airspeed less than 20 knots. If anything out of the ordinary is indicated, the best course of action would be to abort your takeoff. Once you've exited the runway and come to a complete stop, you can then safely troubleshoot the problem. However, under normal conditions, you will continue to accelerate to 55 knots. As the airspeed is increasing, the controls will become more effective. This is due to the increase of air flowing over the control surfaces. Most notably, the airflow under the elevator will actually bring the surface into its neutral position. You will feel this happening as the yoke slides afterward towards you. Once the airspeed reaches 55 knots, it's time to pitch up and begin your climb. This procedure is called rotation. To rotate, smoothly increase back pressure on the yoke, raising the nose until the tip of the engine cowling touches the horizon. This is roughly 9 or 10 degrees of pitch up. Maintain this pitch attitude as you continue to climb out. The goal is to maintain 74 knots. This is the airspeed that gives you the best rate of climb and is also known as VY. You should visually confirm you are climbing using outside references and that your vertical speed indicator is showing a positive value. Next, while climbing out, you should momentarily step on the brakes. As your wheels lift off the ground, they will continue to spin, and this spinning usually results in vibrations. Now that you're airborne, it's important to continuously look outside for traffic and terrain clearance. Remember, 90% of the time, your eyes should be looking outside. When the aircraft is at least 200 feet above the ground, briefly lower the nose toward the horizon to ensure that there is no other traffic in your flight path. Once the area is deemed clear, resume the VY pitch attitude. At 500 feet AGL, lower the pitch to increase the airspeed and continue to climb, now at 85 knots, which is our cruise climb airspeed. At Embry-Riddle, we climb at 85 knots because it allows for better visibility in front of us and better cooling for the engine. If you ever need to climb at a higher vertical rate of climb, do not hesitate to increase the pitch and climb at 74 knots instead. Ideally, a pilot always tries to take off with a direct headwind. However, this very rarely happens. Almost always, there will be some crosswind component. 
Since crosswind takeoffs occur so often, it's important to develop this skill relatively early in your flight training. The correction required during takeoff is very similar to that required during taxiing. If the crosswind is coming from the left, the yoke gets pointed to the left. By doing this, the left aileron is deflected up, creating a downward force on the left wing and preventing that wing from rising too early. The opposite would happen with a crosswind from the right. When lining up on the runway, you should apply full aileron correction into the crosswind. Remember that as the airspeed increases, the controls become more effective. Therefore, as the ailerons become more effective, the pilot needs to reduce the aileron input. Otherwise, you'd be overcompensating for the crosswind. To keep the takeoff path straight down the center line, rudder force will also be necessary. This is because a crosswind condition will cause the airplane to weather vane or turn into the wind. Remember that with a normal takeoff where there is no crosswind, you need right rudder. Now, with the crosswind, things change slightly. If the wind blows from the left, additional right rudder will now be required to compensate for the airplane's tendency to weather vane to the left. However, with a right crosswind, less right rudder will be required as the weather vane tendency to the right will oppose the left turning tendencies. As the airplane is accelerating down the runway, the relative crosswind component never becomes zero. Consequently, aileron input will be used throughout the entire takeoff. With improper crosswind correction, the airplane may begin to get pushed off centerline. This side loading causes stress on the landing gear, so it's important to use aileron correction throughout the entire takeoff roll. As the airplane lifts off the ground, the downwind wing and wheel should rise and lift off the runway first. If gusty winds exist, the rotation may be slightly delayed in order to allow the airspeed to rise, allowing a definite takeoff without settling back onto the runway. Once the airplane is in the air, the airplane should remain on the extended runway centerline just like a normal takeoff. A crosswind takeoff and climb is very similar to a normal takeoff and climb except for control input. Simply put, a crosswind takeoff requires additional aileron and rudder inputs in order to keep the airplane on the center line with wings level. Crosswind takeoffs require finesse, but you'll have plenty of time to practice these during your flight training.